On this Wednesday night, who's leading the so-called Freedom Convoy? With borders blocked and protesters holding steady, what's next for the organizers of these disruptive protests? We need to focus on the goal of removing the mandates, removing the passport. Kids on the front line. We're not going to put our child in that kind of jeopardy, ever. Police raise concerns over children living in some of the trucks parked near Parliament Hill. Plus, living with COVID. As more provinces lift public health restrictions, what does the science say? And the medals mount Canada's latest triumphs at the Beijing Olympic Games. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We are continuing to watch the disruptions caused by protests in this country and looking more deeply at the organizers. This is the Ambassador Bridge from Detroit to Windsor. Traffic from the U.S. to Canada remains blocked by trucks and protesters demanding freedom, disrupting supply lines and businesses that employ thousands of people, forcing truckers and others to take long detours. That has led to a backlog at a second border crossing near Sarnia. We'll have more on that in just a moment. The former U.S. ambassador to Canada, Bruce Heyman, tweeted this today. The protests in Ottawa, Canada and the Ambassador Bridge are less and less about vaccines and more and more about political extremism and desires to disrupt the Canadian government and economy done with external radical influences and money. There is a lot to dissect about these protests, and there are a range of grievances. One of the main organizers, Canada Unity, asked people to sign this Memorandum of Understanding, which it planned to give to the Senate and the Governor-General, compelling them to drop public health measures or dissolve the government. That is undemocratic and unconstitutional. Now the group says that does not reflect the spirit and intent of the convoy, and it has withdrawn the Memorandum of Understanding to avoid what it calls any unintended interpretations. So what are the intentions of the organizers and what are their next moves? Ross Lord has our top story tonight from Ottawa. Protesters and their supporters are still squeezing in signatures on this vehicle. Among them, retired military member Adam Rickman. He says he's tired of pandemic restrictions. I'm not into wearing masks and restricting my breathing. I'm not into having forced needles. But others warn protest supporters should be careful about what they're signing up for. They say the occupation is about much more than masks or distancing. They say it's part of a larger plan that threatens democracy. We see it uh, uh, all over uh, all over the Western world, the, this uh, emboldening of far-right extremist actors. Um, and uh, we, we are not immune to it here in Canada. What we share right now is a blossoming autocratic threat on the North American continent. It is more advanced in the United States. But you just saw the first petals bloom in Canada, and it won't be the last of it. It's unclear what the hierarchy looks like behind the so-called Freedom Convoy, if there is a hierarchy. Among the key catalysts is Tamara Leach. Her previous campaigns include promoting the Wexit Party. Our departure will be based on the Prime Minister doing what is right. Pat King supported Wexit too. He's now a vocal convoy organizer who calls himself an investigative journalist. Wait till the real bullets start flying. But one of the main speakers at a recent news conference was Tom Morazzo, a former military engineer. He led the call for overthrowing the federal government during the occupation. The more of us there are, the better it is for all of us. Morazzo is no longer named as a spokesperson for the convoy. But it's hard to confirm who is. Global News reached out to purported communications contacts, but got no reply. Organizers of a news conference Wednesday did not invite Global News and refused to admit other media. Along with new questions about who's organizing the occupation, there are shifting political positions on ending it. I said it's time to go now. Time to get back to work. A different tone from Conservative MP Kevin Waugh, who was posing with protesters when the convoy first arrived. As for its phenomenal ability to raise money online, the federal government says it's investigating. Back at street level, there are smaller gestures aimed at reclaiming the city for its residents, who've been subjected to around-the-clock noise pollution, verbal harassment, public urination, and street blockades. Convoy organizers should just sort of be confronted with that reality. After waiting more than a week to take action, Ottawa police are putting protesters on notice their trucks could be seized if they continue blocking streets illegally. On day 13, a signal this occupation might be closer to coming to a head. Ross Lord, Global News, Ottawa. 
The CEO of Canada's largest trucking conglomerate says the cross-border vaccine mandate for truckers, which is in place in Canada and the United States, is not an issue at all for his company. Ale Bedard, the chief executive of TFI International Inc., points out the majority of truckers in Canada are vaccinated and that his cross-border truckers who have chosen not to be vaccinated have been reassigned to Canadian routes. The blockade by protesters at North America's busiest land border is having an impact on supply chains. The Ambassador Bridge between Windsor and Detroit is blocked to U.S. traffic coming to Canada and forcing truckers and others who don't support it to take long detours. Sean O'Shea reports. Like a backup goalie in hockey, the Blue Water Bridge has suddenly been called into action. Because a couple of hours away in Windsor, protesters are still not letting trucks cross the much larger Ambassador Bridge into Canada. This man, who calls himself Greg, defends the ongoing blockade. Why do I think I have the right? Why does any protester think he has the right to do anything? For three days, shipments have been diverted and slowed down, frustrating many driving those delayed rigs and infuriating industries that count on speedy deliveries. It's a huge challenge for all the industries involved, for all the employees involved, and of course for you know just the flow of goods to, to final citizens. To consumers, it's it's just um, it's staggering, actually. The auto industry is especially dependent on those shipments and thousands of jobs. It is breathlessly stupid for a group that wants to uh, inspire people to join their movement to put those same people out of work. And now, and here we are formally requesting additional resources. Windsor's mayor is asking for federal and provincial help, including more police officers. Is there a timeline to get this resolved? Again, it's, Today, as tomorrow. the situation unfolds, um, we're not going to discuss our operational plans. Public safety is the number one priority and we're looking to restore traffic flow in the area. As pressure to shut down this protest and reopen the bridge to incoming trucks intensifies. Such action may inflame the situation uh, and for, certainly cause more folks to come here and add to the protest and we don't want to risk additional conflict. Back at the protest, I asked Greg about that. If they decide to uh, to break this up, what are you guys going to do? There'll be some resistance, just like Black Lives Matter resists. Nothing's likely to change in Windsor until that city gets the support it's looking for. Near here, there was a brief protest, but they moved on. The unofficial concern, a second block bridge, because as difficult as this situation is, that would be significantly worse. Donna. All right, Sean O'Shea in Point Edward, Ontario. Thank you. Well, Ottawa remains under a state of emergency. The police said again today it's time for the protesters to go home. The deputy police chief describes the remaining protesters as highly determined and volatile. They estimate about a quarter of the 400 vehicles have children inside them and officers have concerns about their well-being. Abigail Beeman spoke to some of the children's parents. This trucker family has been parked in Ottawa for 13 days with their five-year-old. There's not a parent down here that would jeopardize the safety or the health of their child. We brought them down here so that they can be proud of the moment. Kathleen Callahan says it's sad police are now working with the Children's Aid Society over concerns about safety. The risk of uh, carbon monoxide and fumes. The noise level, concerned about cold, we're concerned about access to sanitation, um, uh, uh, the ability to, to shower. Um, there's a multitude of concerns. We've had a ton of support from a lot of the Ottawa residents who have opened their homes for showers, using their bathrooms. So, you know, it's not like we're locked in these trucks. I think it's disgusting that they would take the chance of traumatizing the children with CAS. There was no media availability with police Wednesday and the Children's Aid Society declined multiple interview requests. In a joint statement, the organization said police would report any potential dangers they observe to the CAS and that there have been ongoing reports around welfare concerns. But the CAS wouldn't respond to a number of questions by deadline, including how many calls they've received, what type of concerns they're looking at, and whether they'd consider removing any children from here. We've seen no indication of anything unsafe at all. I mean, the only things we've seen that say it's unsafe are reports from legacy media. These cabins are designed to be slept in while vehicles are running. So, I mean, at this point, it seems like they're trying to pull straws and anything they can to try and add scare tactics. Parents Global News spoke to say they want to teach their children about protests and call for change. She has no idea what a birthday party is, family gathering, she has a doctor's appointment. We can't even go in as a family. 
But this family says if police were to move in in some kind of raid, they would leave immediately for the sake of their daughter's safety. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Give, Send, Go, which calls itself a Christian crowdfunding site, is the new home for the so-called Freedom Convoy's fundraising campaign after GoFundMe shut down fundraising for the group. Nearly $8 million U.S. has been raised on Give, Send, Go. The goal is $16 million. The largest single donation so far is $215,000. There's not a lot of transparency about who is donating. Campaign organizers say they'll ensure the money goes to aid and legal support for truckers and their families. GoFundMe shut down the convoy's donation page on Friday, claiming it violated the site's terms, prohibiting content supporting violence. Give, Send, Go says it does not condone violence in any form. The site was blocked last year after it was used to raise money for people involved in the attempted insurgency at the U.S. Capitol. Well, U.S. lawmakers are threatening to investigate GoFundMe for shutting down the fundraising for the group. Texas Senator Ted Cruz is accusing it of effectively trying to steal the $10 million raised. The fundraiser has gained support from lots of people and groups outside Canada. And now the U.S. is bracing for a potential nationwide convoy of its own. Jackson Prosco looks at the false information fueling much of that support. With the maple leaf leading the way, copycat convoys rolled out across New Zealand and in Europe, where French truck drivers are headed to Brussels. They have the courage to do what the Canadians have done before us, said this supporter. Will we need our own trucker rally to end all of this insanity once and for all? In the U.S., conservative media have taken up the cause. The truckers of the world are uniting. With breathless coverage of the Ottawa protest, channels like Fox News and Newsmax seem to be urging Americans into the streets. The folks here in charge in America don't want us getting any crazy ideas uh, about standing up for our freedoms in the same way that is happening right now in Canada. The spread of this Canadian contagion is being fueled by misinformation. There are false claims circulating online that exaggerate the size and success of the Ottawa protest, all meant to inspire others. I do think that a lot of what, what we see in terms of attempts to organize something are just kind of people who are just putting it out there and seeing if somebody will bite. Um, you know, I think that should not be overlooked. Based on what's happening in Canada, plans are now in the works for an American version of the convoy. It would arrive here in Washington on March 1st with the goal of disrupting President Biden's trip to the Capitol to deliver his State of the Union address. Researchers warn opportunists around the world are now trying to figure out how to go bigger than the Canadians. And I think they would love to see something that had a significant destructive effect. It leaves little doubt the global movement will continue to spread, inspired by a small, well-organized and well-funded operation that has shown how easily it can cause disruption. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. RCMP in Alberta are aiming to move protesters away from the Canada-U.S. border crossing in the town of Coots. That blockade has disrupted cross-border traffic for 12 days, and the province's move to ease public health restrictions appears to have done little to satisfy people. Alberta has dropped its proof of vaccination requirement today. Saskatchewan plans to do the same later this week. Everyone is tired of public health restrictions, and no government has said they intend to keep them in place forever. As Heather Urex West reports, when to do it and why is the subject of hot debate. Just a couple of hours after Alberta's Premier announced plans to end the province's proof of vaccine program and other COVID restrictions, protesters at the Coots border crossing made it clear they were not satisfied. Overall, it's disappointing. Yeah, there was some good that come out of it, but not even, not even a 10%. By 8 o'clock Tuesday, access to the busy crossing was blocked again. But as protesters call for the lifting of even more COVID restrictions, others in Alberta fear these changes are happening too soon. I think there's two components to it. One, I think it's sending the wrong message. COVID is far from over. And secondly, our healthcare system is still under severe stress. The reality is, across Alberta and Saskatchewan, the number of people in hospital with COVID is near an all-time high. And the number of people in Alberta who have received a booster dose is less than 40%. It's why these Edmonton parents aren't sure how they feel about in-school mask mandates lifting next week. I'm kind of mixed because uh, 
Um, personally, I think uh, they serve a purpose. I'm very concerned about this because um, they're little and I don't want them to be sick. Restaurant owners are unhappy too, because while Alberta is ending its proof of vaccine program, also known as the REP, other rules like the 11 o'clock end to liquor sales will remain. The Alberta Hospitality Association says it doesn't make sense. We've been very clear that, uh, if anything, step process-wise, the restriction should be lifted and maybe REP stays in place. After two years of restrictions, convoy protesters aren't the only ones who want things back to normal. Alberta and Saskatchewan are now forging a path, but it's not without risk. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. The risk and rewards of lifting pandemic measures coming up. When is the right time? Experts weigh in on the possible risks of moving too fast. Plus, Alberta's Premier apologizes for comments he made about the unvaccinated. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney has apologized for comparing attitudes towards unvaccinated people to the stigma people with AIDS and HIV faced in the 1980s. Kenney tweeted today, I made an inappropriate analogy to the stigmatization of people with AIDS. I was wrong to do so and apologize without reservation. This is what he said yesterday while announcing his plan to lift most public health restrictions, including proof of vaccination. In a way, it kind of reminds me of the... Uh, attitudes that circulated in North America in the mid-1980s about people with HIV AIDS. That there, there's this notion that they, they had to be kind of d distanced for health reasons. That quickly led to a backlash. Kenny has faced widespread criticism for his political history with the gay community. In 1989, he helped overturn a spousal law in San Francisco that permitted gay men to visit their dying partners in the hospital during the AIDS pandemic. I've helped to lead a, 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 a ultimately successful initiative petition, which led to a ref referendum which overturned the first gay spousal law in North America. That video of Kenny explaining his role surfaced in 2019 before he was elected Premier. Ahead as provinces lift restrictions, what does the science tell us? Everyone wants public health restrictions to be lifted and for life to return to normal. We know what's happened, though, when they've been lifted too soon. COVID cases and hospitalizations have soared. Now, vaccination levels are higher than they've ever been. Jamie Marocker looks at what's being weighed as these decisions are made. Christy Dickinson is immunocompromised, and soon she'll have to navigate how to stay healthy in a world without COVID-19 restrictions. I would hope that as we look at reopening, um, that we can do so, you know, in a, in a thoughtful, um, you know, step-by-step -step way. In Ontario, where Dickinson lives, the province is moving forward with a phased reopening plan, making it easier for her to adjust. Quebec and Prince Edward Island have also laid out strategies to lift public health measures over the course of the next month or so, but Saskatchewan and Alberta are ripping the restrictions band-aid right off. I think it's a political decision, but, you know, science-based decisions, you know, often through the pandemic have not sort of looked at the economic issues, so you kind of have to balance the two. But decision makers have to strike that balance, this epidemiologist says, with local evidence in mind. Hospital rates, ICU rates, wastewater rates, if they're going down and they have been for the last three weeks, then we can look forward to, to taking a few more steps. Prairie hospitalizations have shown a slight decline, but have not consistently dipped. If we remove mass mandates, if we remove vaccine passports, if we remove gathering limits, there's no reason to think that numbers won't just go up. One of the first countries to choose to live with COVID, Denmark, is now experiencing a record number of hospitalizations. And although ICU numbers remain low, COVID deaths remain about the same as they did last year. The spike wasn't unexpected, but Canada's healthcare system is more fragile. But let's try and keep the increase to a speed bump level, not another cliff face of, a, of an increase. We want to control it. Dickinson worries another wave means she won't be able to access in-person care. 
that's a really uh, important uh, aspect of the reopening for me. And for so many others who have had their health sidelined because of the pandemic. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. Statistics Canada has released data from the latest census, and it shows how fast Canada's population is growing. Our population reached nearly 37 million last year. That's a 5.2 percent increase over five years, the fastest growth rate of any G7 country. Though Canada saw its lowest growth rate in a century in 2020, just 0.4 percent. Despite COVID-related limitations, immigrants helped fuel the population boost. Next, Team Canada speeds and soars its way to the medal podium again. Canada has upped its medal haul to eight on day five of the Winter Olympics in Beijing. Stephen Dubois won silver in the men's 1500 meter short track event. The 24 year old Olympic rookie is from Quebec. And Canada is bringing home another bronze. Marietta O'Dine finished third in women's snowboard cross. This is also her Olympic debut and Canada's first podium finish in the event since the 2014 Sochi Games. We could get another medal in team figure skating. The final results are still in doubt, though, two days after the competition. No one has been awarded medals, just flowers. The IOC is blaming the holdup on legal issues. There are few details, but officials have confirmed medal winners are involved in the case. Canada placed fourth in the event. Russia finished first, the U.S. second, and Japan third. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Belle Isle Bay near Kingston, New Brunswick. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.